Uh, hi, my name is James Piper. I'm Vice President of Sales for Millennial Media. Um, uh, we are the largest independent mobile platform. Um, and I've got some great guests up here with us to talk about, um, the topic is mobile first, um, and to think about how leadership brands are adapting to the shifts in consumer focus. That sounds very lofty. But it looks like, I was just speaking with Megan here, Megan Tweed, um, uh, that you all look like you're pretty savvy. Uh, before we get going, can I get a show of hands? Who's, who's in marketing in one way or another? Okay, there's our answer. I don't even need to ask any of the other questions. Okay, who has a smartphone on them right now? Okay, everyone that raised their hand, put it on mute. <laughs> gotcha. You're all like, I've got one, I've got one. Yeah, we all have one. That's why we're here. Okay, so let me introduce the panel. Um, on my far left is Barbara Williams. She's global SEM and, and digital advertising lead for Microsoft's Interactive Entertainment Business Group. <laughs> we got, and uh, please hold your applause till the end. We don't want anyone to feel left out. Uh, Kevin Shaver, Senior Account Director at Point Reach. He's representing brands like eBay, Walgreens, and Microsoft. We've got Paul Jennings. Oops, I'm sorry. I knew, I said I was smart enough to do that, and I guess I'm not. You know what, I skipped. We didn't sit in order. That actually is Paul Jennings. He is um, the senior, uh, excuse me, he is, let's start over, Director of Strategy, OMD in Chicago, representing Intel. And then to his right, we've got Kevin Shaver from Point Reach. And finally, we have someone that's not listed uh, or it wasn't listed earlier. We're not certain why. It certainly wasn't because we don't like her. Uh, <laughs> Megan Tweed, she's VP of Media at Razorfish, representing Best Buy. Um, so real quickly, um, what I thought I'd do is kind of set the stage. Everyone has smartphones. Everyone understands, at least in this room, everyone understands why we're here and why this is important. Let's just show a couple of, uh, of quick points uh, to, to set the stage, if you will. So smart, smartphone user growth, uh, it's, it's, it's been something we've been hearing about over and over and over over the last couple of years. By 2016, about a third of the world's population will have smartphones. Uh, tablet and, and smartphone shipments have, have surpassed PC shipments and are going to continue to do so, although one could argue that tablets and PCs are going to start to blend more and more, so that might be a, kind of a fuzzy metric. Um, in the U.S., we're ahead of the curve. Globally, about 75% of, uh, of new handsets sold today are, are, are smartphones. Um, so what are we using the smartphones for? Um, as far as time spent, mostly for internet, social media, music, games, believe it or not, less than 20% of our time is spent actually using the phone, email, or text. Those are pretty quick, not a lot of time intensive um, opportunities. Uh, so we're absorbing all this, this content, uh, news, weather, social, uh, looking for restaurants, things like that. Apps have been a huge driving force in, in why smartphones uh, are so important for people. 133% uh, year over year growth in time spent on app versus web on the mobile phones. Uh, time spent overall, I'm not gonna get too much into the, the, the point about the, the time spent versus uh, media uh, budget, things like that. The point is, is that finally mobile has surpassed print as far as time spent in, in media consumption. Um, obviously, we're gonna use tablets and, and phones quite differently. Uh, smartphones, more on the go for communication and connecting, quick and immediate information. Um, tablets, often at home. A lot of times entertainment oriented, certainly a more relaxed and leisurely uh, use. Um, and as such, when you look at how many times per day you use your phone versus a tablet, for those that have both devices, uh, it's about the same amount of time that you're using those two devices, but the amount of time that you're spending with a tablet at any given time is much longer and uh, less frequent. Obviously, when you look at what, type, what times of the day we're using these phones, you wake up, your smartphone is often the first screen you'll see all day. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got a, sp a spike at work for both, both types of devices. Certainly at night, there's a little different trend in the way people are using tablets. 
um, more around bedtime and, and, and TV time than, than, than smartphones. But certainly there's a huge percentage of, of these device owners that are using these devices while they're watching TV. So herein lies the question that we're, we're gonna try to answer today. Um, obviously, once you get people into a retail setting, if you, you are a retailer, 40% of those people are, are comparing prices online while shopping in the store. And I know that's something that's, that's, that's near and dear to, uh, to, to Best Buy's heart. Um, searching for online, um, uh, you know, or using online coupons, 25% of us are, are, are doing that. Almost 20% are using location-based services. And while still small, it's growing. Point of sale um, uh, purchases using the phone, about 8%. So if we could go back to the title screen so everyone could see um, the panelists' names, it'd be great. Um, I'm gonna start out um, actually by letting each of the folks kind of give a little bit about their background and why they're up here and kind of what, what this all means to them. And let's, let's, start, uh, let's start with Barbara Williams. And I'm on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so yes, Barbara Williams. I've been with Microsoft uh, about five years now. Most of that time I spent in the central marketing group the last few years um, in a role that was um, developed to create capability and to develop our mobile marketing capability amongst our marketers. We had about 6,000 marketers worldwide. And so my role was to work with all of those marketers in terms of training, best practices, strategic framework, and really understanding how to leverage mobile as a marketing communications channel. Obviously, as Microsoft, we understand it from a product perspective and from a services perspective. But when it comes to actually marketing communications, we really needed to, to double down on that and understand it better. Um, and then since mm, February or so this year, I've actually transitioned into the interactive entertainment business group group, AKA Xbox, um, and my role has changed there where I'm not focused primarily on mobile, but now search globally. And, and as you can imagine, mobile has a, a really critical role to play within search and vice versa. Um, and then I would almost describe my role as kind of a digital jack of all trades because I also still do digital advertising and campaign development for some of our platform campaigns. So my, my background is kind of in mobile and now extending that into broader digital search kind of between creative and, and media functions as well. Okay, Paul. Um, so I uh, currently work at OMD in Chicago. Um, I oversee the Intel account for um, all kinds of media, uh, mobile and tablet being an increasingly big part of that. Um, what I'm doing at the moment is leading our consumer campaigns, which is Ultrabook, um, which is kind of I don't want to say the last ditch attempt to keep computers at the forefront, but it's very much, you know, keeping laptops still very relevant in the in the space where iPad and all the other tablets are continuing to grow. Um, my background before that was very much heavily uh, in one of the other spaces, which was Apple themselves. I worked on that account for five years, seeing the launch of iPhone, um, very skeptical at the time of that. Um, iPad, MacBook Air. Um, even iAd, which I'm still a little bit skeptical about, um, and also 20th Century Fox. So I've seen the full gamut, both globally and locally, across all media of, of pretty much everything now. And um, what we're seeing now is is a, a very interesting time for um, for this space, not just because of Apple, but because of what everyone else is doing and um, what's you know hopefully going to become a next uh, an interesting thing in the next two or three years. Great, Kevin. Uh, yeah, so my name is Kevin Chauvin. and I'm with uh, a mobile agency called Point Reach. It's, uh, it's local, and we um, help large advertisers with uh, mobile campaigns. So uh, everything we focus on is, is primarily mobile, and um, I've been there about two years, and during that time, uh, my main accounts have been uh, Bing, eBay, and, and Walgreens. So we do uh, all the, the mobile planning and buying and camp campaign management for them. Um, and prior to my time at Point Reach, I spent about five years at Starbucks uh, doing um, digital, social, uh, some, some wireless and mobile work there as well. So um, have some, some agency and uh, client side experience as well. 
Uh, Megan Tweed, VP Media here in Seattle at Razorfish. Uh, I've been with Razorfish for about four and a half years, and I've spent that entire time working on the Best Buy account. I've seen the business go through quite a few changes, have led quite a few of those changes um, alongside them. Uh, we take to market many, many campaigns, 70 plus campaigns per year. Mobile is a key platform in almost every single one of those campaigns. I also have done a lot of work with Razorfish extensively to revamp the way that our large TV advertising clients take to market a video investment um, across all screens that's platform agnostic based on reach plus impact to really align that budget better with usage uh, and the impact that's available on these new emerging screens that are not emerging any longer. Um, I've also been working with Best Buy on a, a big data project, another buzzword for you there, um, where we've been aggregating all of Best Buy's cookie level data from their uh, digital platforms in a central location and using it as a, um, a way to modify the way that we um, appropriately uh, talk to folks across all digital platforms. And my current challenge is figuring out how do I take that great data from all those platforms and use it on the mobile platform. Quite a challenge. Great. So before I forget, if I haven't already said it, thanks again so much for your time to sit up here, and thanks to all of you for attending the, the, uh, the discussion. So let's get going. Um, I had this question in mind. Um, I'm not going to always go like this. Feel free to go out of turn. I have already have when I was introducing you, so no one knows who you are anyway. Uh, just kidding. Um, so I'm going to start with Barbara again, just because I had you in mind. Because um, video gaming in and of itself um, is in many ways its own form of media. Um, and often the premise is that media consumption uh, is followed pretty quickly by marketing. Um, how, has, how has Xbox, um, how has their, their user base uh, and the way that they're using mobile changed the product design, the approach for uh, Microsoft from just a product standpoint? Oh, yeah, it's, it's actually huge. I think... Um, for those who are not aware, we just announced last week, um, well, actually announced a few months ago, but really started to launch it last week, um, our new platform or service, Xbox Smart Glass. And that is really meant to take that living room led experience to your mobile device or your tablet device so that there will be games that you will have companion experience just imagine you know playing dance intro and you can queue up the next call the next song and and really interact with what's going to happen on the game on your television vision screen but through your tablet or imagine that you're watching something through Xbox Video on your television and then you can um, understand and, and get information about what you're watching on your movie with your uh, Smart Glass um, app because it will be, it, it is an app that right now is available on Windows 8 and Windows RT, but that will extend to other platforms as well. So it's not a separate piece of hardware you have to buy, but whatever tablet that you have and smartphone that you have, you'll be able to download that. But then to be able to interact with your, your video, your music, or take that movie that you were watching and then swipe it, flick it over to your tablet and then leave with it and continue to watch it where you are. So, I mean, and that's just one aspect of the different ways in terms of products that we're looking at extending what that Xbox brand is and the content and the true entertainment beyond gaming that you can experience and taking that with you wherever. And I think this year is the first year that you're really going to start to see as a product and as a brand, Xbox, you know, start to leave the living room. We're still there, anchored, but then that it, it'll be something that you can take with you wherever you are. And I think that was a huge shift for the organization from an engineering and a development perspective, from a product perspective. And now, as you, to your point, it's time for the marketing to follow that. We have multi-channel marketing, but it absolutely can be stronger and really needs to follow that strong lead that the product side has taken with us. Okay. Thanks for that. So... I'm going to shift over to, to Best Buy real quickly. Obviously, you're not creating media. You are selling goods and services. You're a retailer, first and foremost. How has, has your consumer base changed in the way that they're interacting with your services of, of selling? Well, um, we definitely have seen <laughs> quite a bit of uh, behavior in stores impacted by the mobile platform. Um, a lot of price checking going on. Uh, a lot of tapping your social network to figure out, is this actually what I should be buying? Um, even just texting your significant other and saying, I'm going to go for it or not. 
Um, we've been very proactive in trying to intercept those conversations, both with geo and, and location-based fencing. Um, also partnering with price checking apps and making sure that we have our messaging front and center whenever they're scanning something that's within the consumer electronics category. Um, I would say, though, as a retailer, the biggest challenge and opportunity is bringing some level of relevancy to all of those conversations. So all of the research that we do on these digital platforms, we can tap into that via our mobile platforms when we're there in the store. And that represents an opportunity for Best Buy to have a more relevant conversation if they can know about all of those uh, points of research that happened before someone showed up in the store on a customer ID level. So that's what we're trying to get at. How do I take that cookie level information and once somebody shows up in the store, have some knowledge of what happened before they got there? Okay, great, great. Paul, um, Intel, obviously, you, you mentioned your, your Ultrabook, the, the kind of the last effort to make sure that, that, that PCs are relevant. And I think, uh, you know, the other, the other point is that it's, it's been very noticeable that Intel is very much a part of, uh, you know, the, the latest Windows 8 uh, tablet focused. Um, with keyboard type of, 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 of product, there's always going to be something there for Intel, I would imagine. But what's, what's kind of the main focus for you as far as the way consumers uh, are interacting with mobile and, and Intel's main focus? Um, I think one of the, the big challenges we, we've been facing in the last year is we've shifted from, a, from an older audience who are all feature phone based to a younger audience. So one of our big challenges is really just making sure we're talking to them in the right way, and one of those platforms is mobile. Unfortunately, you know, just advertising a mobile is one part of it. There's, there's other parts of it as well, which is, do you have a good mobile website? And the truth is, most advertisers don't. You know, they have HTML5, but they're not using it. They're not using that screen real estate properly. And you often find that <clears throat> the site you've created looks great on a PC desktop, it looks great on a decent sized tablet, it does not look good on mobile. Mm. Um, and that's a, a big issue you face when you have you know, 18, 34 year olds thinking, well, I wanna actually use my mobile to go in and price check and to research, and it's just not the right experience. Um, which is why I think you know, what we have done on Intel for media is we very much made mobile one part of a larger program or a larger um, experience for engagement. Um, that's proven easy in some ways. Um, we've had some great partners we've worked with. Um, I will say Microsoft has been one of them. Um, but we've, have, uh, we've had others that really haven't been, and I think that's come from partners and vendors in this industry who are, one, very new um, to, the, to the world and, and really are just getting on their feet, therefore, to understand how advertising can work and mobile, and two, people who just don't get it. Um, it's, it's a complicated space at the moment. Even now, there's still not the standardization that exists in what I'll call traditional digital. Um, that's been around for a lot longer, and, and mobile just doesn't have that yet. That's been a huge problem for us in terms of making sure everything works across every platform, <clears throat> sorry, platform from iOS to Android to Windows Mobile, um, and even those few people who are still using touchscreen Blackberries. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have a new space, we've got <clears throat> you know, multiple different size tablets. You know, there's a huge wave of them coming. So we've got iPad mini, Nexus 7, Kindle Fire HD, um, and Surface itself. It creates a lot of fragmentation, and without that standardization, makes it very difficult for us to create a proper engaging experience without just sort of going to your standard IAB banner sizes. So finding spaces and experiences to really get the audiences is one of our big challenges at the moment when people are so used to just Seeing mobile ads, sorry, seeing mobile ads for the most part, and ignoring them. So, Kevin, uh, Point Reach obviously is focused on solely mobile, correct? Um, I, it, all these different devices that Paul's talking about. Uh, we've got the the iPad Mini, which, by the way, I thought was just the iPhone, but whatever. <laughs> we're go we're going back to that giant trio I had that looked like a desktop calculator. Hello. Um, uh, so I guess it's not really a phone. I shouldn't say that. Anyway, it's an iPad. Um, but how much? Apple. Go ahead. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I said continue to bash Apple. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Let's talk about the Windows Phone. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> I, I use an iPhone. I probably I probably won't get a mini anyway. Um, so from a from a mobile uh, perspective, being at a shop that focuses only on mobile, 
how, how, how much do you get um, focused on all these new different devices? Do you wait until you see usage patterns? Do you, to, do you wait till you find out if actually the, the iPad mini is actually gonna take off or if it's gonna be irrelevant in another five years? Obviously you have to be prepared for everything, but how do you lead from that kind of a standpoint? From a, what's your strategy around that? Yeah, um, so a lot of the challenges that, that Paul just announced is one of the main reasons why we're around, right? I mean, that's, that's what we do is, is we come in and it's, mobile is really, really hard and that's what, that's what we do. We, we build sizes for all, all the multiple devices and so we've got um, a, a large portion of the folks at Reach are, you know, tech, technologists and, and build for those devices. And so um, one of the nice things is, is that um, you can do it quickly. So, so we don't necessarily need to wait for uh, usage patterns. You can actually jump in, build the units, and test them rather quickly, and find out you know what they do for the brands, and and if they if they're you know take too much time to to build for and don't give the ROI that we're looking for, then then yeah, we don't invest further, but but we don't have to wait for the for them to take off to be able to to go to our clients and say now we should maybe try something. Okay, now you just used an acronym that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand. It could be good or it could be bad. You said ROI. There's an opportunity there. How are we going to make this work? Um, so I'm going to put the question out to anyone who wants to answer on the stage. Um, uh, do you think inherently, and you can talk separately from smartphones to tablets, do you think inherently mobile is better for brand type messaging or is it better for more direct response? ROI could mean a lot of different things, um, obviously. But do we have a, just a general gut feel? I mean, I, I think both. I've had success with both. Um, I don't think it should be an either or. I definitely think with tablets, we see uh, a lot of shopping behavior, just a lot of engagement, um, time spent, and um, a lot of page views just combing through, checking out everything. Um, a lot of the deals-based messaging that I think a lot of marketers have um, sort of pivoted and started thinking about a lot with, um, with mobile platforms really does well. Um, an app that just has deals all the time. People love that. They eat it up. Um, but when I think about the mobile platform, um, classic mobile platform um, with branding, I've seen great impact from um, the video space, actually. Mm -hmm four times greater impact uh, against branding metrics with the mobile device because you, there's no distraction, there's no other windows, there's no anything, it's just the video right there. So as long as like the 4G devices and, and you know, the adoption of those new devices continues to trend up, I think video consumption and uh, its association with branding campaigns is gonna just increase. But Barbara, when you and I were speaking earlier, you mentioned that uh, you felt like the advertising uh, industry on the whole is still a TV forward uh, industry. So how does what Megan's saying here, and, and certainly tablet and that type of usage, how does that, does that change this? Do you think it's going to make a, a major impact on, on that mentality, or is it something that's just going to kind of stretch out? I mean, I, I, I can say what I hope. I definitely hope that there's kind of a shift from um, from really focusing on the television strategy and budget and really focusing there and then, oh, by the way, um, what do we have left? Then we can do some mobile and yeah. digital even. You know, it's not even just a mobile issue, it's a digital all-up issue. But I think the more we can, can start to educate um, executives and the folks that kind of hold the keys and hold the budget dollars that, okay, great, yes, we, TV is probably not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. There's a lot of data that says that you know, it's still impactful, but let's look at that and understand they're not only watching television, so if you have a significant television strategy and budget, you have to complement that with digital and mobile because they're using both. And think about how much further you can take that. You know, you're watching a television, um, an ad, but then you can pull that into an actual ex experience and engagement on a tablet. That's, that's like nirvana, that's like the win-win, yeah. but you have to plan it that way and have the strategy, you know, the core of your creative strategy has to allow for that as well, as well as the media strategy. Mm -hmm. So I think it opens up opportunities, but there's still a lot of education. You know, it's not an easy thing. The experiences have to be relevant and have to be quality. There's a lot of device fragmentation, 
and things to figure out. And, and, you know, there's a little bit of apprehension. We still have limited budgets, even more limited in the last few years than before. So there's apprehension in terms of making major investments in these other areas that we really have to make in order to grow and understand it and to create the quality experiences. So it's almost like a, a, a vicious cycle of yeah. Of experience. If you look at the um, the mobile usage during like the Super Bowl or the Oscars or something, it's like it's way mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. So um, all of our mobile strategies when our clients have like a Super Bowl spot are focused within a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to own all of the mobile inventory that we possibly can during that time period because sometimes they're doing something related to what they're watching. Other times it's totally unrelated, but you want to be there. Um, you can kind of encourage that sort of sequential activity, you know, ask them to do something on their mobile phone. We've got a big program at the ESPN that's launching during Monday Night Football where we're basically sending people to a phone app during the programming of the game. Um, and a lot of that, you know, sort of experience people are used to and they, they like, they engage with it. Mm -hmm. um, so taking a, a large TV uh, account and really focusing the mobile strategy around how it can pay, pay off on the activities going on during that TV strategy is really key. And that's super smart, but it's, it's also a risk that I feel like a lot of um, folks would be hesitant to make because the idea is, okay, we're going to use this 30-second X million dollars that we're spending. We want to talk about our product. We want to talk about the things we want people to know about us versus we want to send them somewhere and then we can engage them. And I think there's a mindset that has to change in terms of developing those strategies to be okay with that. It's not just about getting your message out. You, your message may be to get them to do something else yeah. to really then be able to get your message in. So that's, that's a great strategy. Yeah. I, I think a, a big part of it is there's a, I mean, at least from, a, from an agency side, is there's a big education job that needs to be done. I yeah. think we've gone um, uh, very much, you know, People understand that TV's not going away. It's still technically bigger than ever. It's just networks down, cables up, fragmentation, video. It's just what I think we're trying to make our clients understand is when you're doing this creative, don't just create it for television. Create it for every medium because lack of consistency across all of these spaces is what's killing you. You know, you've really got to make sure that your mobile ad looks like your TV ad, that it has some sort of follow through there. And if it doesn't, then there's going to be a disconnect. And when you think, um, you know, we've increasingly seen from our clients is they want to see everything measured in TRPs. That's great, but... <laughs> but not, not great. All, yeah, because <laughs> not all TRPs are created equal. And quite frankly, you've, you experience and you, you take in the messaging differently on these different platforms. So while we want to still plan holistically and do a holistic plan and everything else, we want to really explain to them that... that you know, TV is this way and you're watching it and you may be doing something at the same time. Mm. If you're on your computer screen or, you know, if you're on your mobile device, that's a different experience. You may have like a dozen windows open on your, uh, on your desktop. If you're watching on mobile, odds are there's far less clutter there. So experiencing that and, and making people, making our clients understand that there are different ways to do this thing while still keeping it part of the bigger whole is really important for us. And then the reporting angle of it, that becomes increasingly difficult, largely because of Apple. They, they've put a lot of blocks in place, and not to bash my former client, but when they brought iAd out, it was quite clear that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to control that space, and again, while I have done an iAd for my current client, and we thought it was excellent, has there been much buzz about it? Not really. Um, there's a lot of companies doing the same, if not better, experiences and doing them you know, in a far cheaper, far more cost-effective way. And they're broadcast across all platforms, not just an iPhone. Yeah, it's funny too, because the iAd, it was um, initially created to compete with television. It was supposed to be this beautiful brand experience, and uh, that's why it was priced so through the roof. Eight um, figures. <laughs> you brought up a point, though, about digital um, storytelling, and I feel like that's a gap that we're seeing uh, capability-wise within um, you know, some of our clients' uh, organizations as well as some of our partner agencies. There's this whole stuck mentality on the 30-second spot and what happens after that. So you, know, you were talking earlier, Barbara, about digital having um, this sort of table scraps mentality from a budget and planning standpoint. Well, it's even more challenging when you're trying to lead the creative conversation and say, 
okay, great, you know, Weight Watchers are creating this amazing spot with um, Jessica Simpson. We would love to have a bunch of awesome B-roll footage to park on our YouTube channel and get folks there. And that's the sort of story that people want to tell, want to see. You know, they want to, they want to see the behind the scenes. They love seeing, you know, the um, sort of celebrity-based <laughs> real stuff. So. You know, having, having that conversation with your partner agencies and with your client really early on about what you want so you can tell that story across those platforms is where we're seeing some of our challenges now. It's just not ready to be had. And I think just to add a little bit more is I also personally think that mobile is actually helping drive or keep money with TV in a certain way as well. Um, when you think about a couple years ago, DVRs came out and everybody said, you know, you're going to see, you know, everyone's just going to fast forward through your commercials. Um, there really is now some need to watch some things live because you're so tapped into your social, you know, your social media feeds on Facebook or Twitter, and um, and so you know, being there, you know, just, that's just going to increase or keep prices the same. I would I would assume, and um, you know, a personal example is I I wanted to watch the presidential debate, um, but I wasn't able to watch it live, so I I DVR'd it, and then I started looking at Twitter and Facebook and started seeing all these comments about. Binders full of women, and I was like, I need to go. I need to go. <laughs> what is this yeah. binders full of women? And so I had to go what figure it out, and then I didn't go back and watch the debate because I felt like I read and everything that I needed to through those feeds, and so um, it's it's got an impact, on, you know, both ways. Yeah, there's certain media you just can't you can't do that with. Um, from San Francisco, the Giants just won the World Series, and <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I wasn't actually on the team, but. Um, but the, you know the idea of watching this event, and I'm, you know, maybe not even 60 seconds behind, and I get a call from my buddy to say, I just wanted to call you so that when we're old and sitting in rocking chairs, we'll remember when Pablo hit his third home run. I'm like, so he's gonna hit the third now, is he? <laughs> okay, but it, it, you know it happens. So let's shift gears here a little bit. One of the most amazing things, uh, obviously, about the mobile medium. Uh, is this kind of this idea of nirvana, right? This, this uh, right place, right time, because you have this location-based opportunity um, uh, that, that virtually no other medium, certainly it's not done as well in any other medium. Um, how do we take advantage of that? How do we take advantage um, fully uh, of, of, of pushing brand points, but also taking in uh, more tactical opportunities like geofencing. Are there ways to really make that work right now or is it really more just kind of testing and just trying to see what works because you've got all these questions around standardization and tracking and things like that? Are, are, are you guys that far? Um, I think it, it uh, <laughs> If it works, um, I can't responsibly say one way or another because the tracking's just not there. But um, honestly, I've had a lot of campaigns that we've taken to market for retailers where we've done, um, you know, geofencing around all of their competitors. And, uh, you know, if we can get someone to either download a, a coupon or actually, you know, get to the point where they're looking at a map and trying to figure out how to get to the store, we say, okay, yeah, that's, that's success for us because um, we're really just trying to drive tra traffic to the store at that point. Um, I definitely think that the communications that happen when someone is in store need to get a bit more nuanced. Um, you know, when I have applications that are constantly dinging at me, regardless of where I am, I tend to just go into those apps and say, forget about it. You know, this is not, this is not how I want to be spending my time and having my phone dinging at me all, all the time. And I think with some of our clients, that's what we're looking at is how do you get a little bit tighter? How do you have the offer be a lot more relevant to what they're actually looking at, either on that device or on the other devices uh, before they got there? Okay. I think one of the, <clears throat> sorry, problems we faced is, you know, for Intel, we technically don't sell anything. You know, we have Dell and, and everyone else doing that for us. Um, but where we, we have looked into to doing things for, I think one of the, the issues we face is simple things like reception on your phone. Mm. I mean, I, you know, uh, I'm, I live in Chicago. I've been on AT&T since I moved to this country, and I finally got sick of having full bars but never being able to access the internet in my office. So I've gone to Verizon, and it's totally changed. But... The flip side of that is when I catch the, uh, the L to work, which is our subway, who doesn't know anyone who knows that, is um, I now can't use my, my phone on the subway. 
Mm. And I feel similar when I go into certain stores and certain environments where <clears throat> the second you go inside, you lose everything. And that's caused a problem for, for you know, some of the stuff that we'd like to do. I mean, I can go into a Target in Chicago and I'm outside for GLTE, go inside, that I'm on edge. That might be intentional. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, and that's the other thing is that we're, we're seeing, I think, that you know, bricks and mortar retailers are becoming savvy to that. They don't want you to do that. You know, the one place you'd love to see that would be movie theaters where you'd stop people from using their phones. But um, retailers are becoming very clever about that kind of thing. I mean, I, I believe Apple stores originally, they were chosen their location based on if they had good AT&T signals because that's where you know, the original network for them. But definitely what we are finding is that they don't want you to be able to access the web inside the store. You know, I go into Target and I'm on one of those rare occasions where I want to buy a, a DVD from there and Amazon because I, you know, haven't spent $100 there yet and I have to make sure you spend at least that, is, you know, I want to check it against Amazon and can't get a signal. So, there, you know, there's, a lot, there's increasing savviness to kind of keep traditional retail alive uh, at the expense of their, their digital prices as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more um, price matching going on, for sure. Um, I think Target had it right when they started doing product exclusives, though, as well. Um, I've seen Best Buy do a few of those and seen good success. Um, when you're looking at a TV at Walmart and a TV at Best Buy, there might be just one difference in the, in the <laughs> code of the TV, but significantly different performance, you know, and... People just aren't savvy enough to realize that. And I think that's another thing is that the, you know, the ex exclusivity of these retailers is becoming a, not an issue, but they will demand, we want an exclusive SKU. We want the 101B, not the 101A, because you know, it has that extra thing that we can charge an extra 100 bucks for. Whereas in reality, not to say that the average consumer is not that savvy. I would never say that. Um, not to my clients anyway. But the, they won't realize that. They will think, oh, it's, it costs $100. It must have X amount more that's going to make it worthwhile buying in store and not ordering from Amazon when really all it is is it has an extra HDMI port or something like that. And I think we're increasingly having to find ways to really educate consumers because most of them will go in based on specs. Uh, I think we're slowly getting a little bit to the point of where we were when people were buying computers 10, 15 years ago when it was, wow, this has this many megahertz, I'm buying that one. Um, whereas now that seems to have trailed off and I think it's slowly coming back again. People want a longer list of specifications in their products and they're willing to pay, you know, fifty, hundred dollars more isn't that much of a barrier as, as it used to be. Mm. So, you know, challenging that and using mobile to you know price check against these things to go into a store and say well now i know it's not really worth that much more it's it's becoming something we're really interested in but there's a lot of blocks in place to prevent us from doing it so being the optimistic guy not not full on pollyanna <laughs> here but being optimistic um i'd like to think that there are some really good opportunities out there how, what, what are some of the, the location-based um, case studies, if you will, or, or whatever? What have, what have you all seen, either participated in directly or seen another brand do that you think really hit the mark? And I'm, I'm going I'm to start with Kevin. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's, just, there's a lot of testing going on. And so we've done testing. I think that Passbook is, is something that will be interesting to see how it, how it succeeds. And... Um, you know, one thing that, that Walgreens is, is doing is they're integrated in Passbook right out of the gate. Saw a lot of immediate success with it. And, um, you know, you get to designate, so to your point of not having, you know, apps jump up or um, you know, wherever you go, there's, what, 8,000 Walgreens. And so I think everybody lives within, it's like 75% or, or more live within you know, seven miles of a Walgreens. And so it would be constantly popping up, but you get to designate you know, your neighborhood store or the store you're going with, and um, up pops your card. You get to have uh, those, you know, exclusive mobile coupon offers. And so it's still really, really early, but I think, you know, getting to that more, the personalization of what you can do to something that, that you designate is going to be um, where success is. I see. Anyone else? I think some of the, the best stuff I've seen 
you know, in, in recent years is, is a lot of stuff that involves outdoor where you can, you know, take your phone, either link it through Wi-Fi or through Bluetooth and get something out of it. I mean, I've seen probably more from, from actually from outdoor re uh, vendors, the mobile retailers in, you know, you go up to a, a bus shelter and you get a, a simple thing like a free piece of candy. I mean, that's very enticing to people. I mean, not every brand can offer candy because that would be a bit creepy, but... Um, <laughs> And, and we can't offer a free Intel chip because that would cost us a fortune. But that's what I've seen as, as working really well. And I mean, it, and it's odd because I remember this happening, you know, six, seven years ago when I was living in the UK where Bluetooth was huge. It was everywhere because Wi-Fi wasn't really there and you'd have Bluetooth jacking and everything else. But it seems like now things are really catching up in that space and that's an area where people are becoming more savvy and I think seeing the the latest Samsung Galaxy commercials where it's just a matter of you know tapping your phones together to share information that's not really new but it's it's people are now understanding what can be done there and that's that's potentially very powerful um, there's a lot of people saying well you know you can't do that with passbook but passbook's actually you know having used it now actually quite a lot in the past month you know for flying for you know Walgreens itself it's it's a really useful way to, to get people engaged with the brands when they're actually in store, you know, and away from it as well. You know, you can set up reminders, it can be done very well. I think where it's going to potentially change in the future is what technology gets into the phones in the future. And it, it feels like, and I did kind of a, a basic survey of my team before I left, is Everyone's saying to me, well, you know, I've got the iPhone 5 now. Why? What can possibly be an iPhone 6 that's going to be that great? Because Better maps. Sorry? <laughs> Better maps. <laughs> yeah. I think we've, we've almost reached, you know, for a certain amount of time, it feels like we've reached an apex as to what's going to be in the phone. So now it feels like it's the time where everyone's going to start using all of these APIs, using everything mm -hmm. that's actually in the phones and really expanding what we can do with it at a, at a retail and advertising level. And I think that's the exciting time for us because we're not going to be constantly trying to play catch up, which I feel like has what's been happening in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. That's going to move over to the tablet space for sure because that's becoming very you know, difficult and, and very different. But mobile, I think, has kind of caught up with itself. And that's where you know, the, the, kind of the old frontier and the new frontier are really meeting. Barbara, speaking of the UK, you did a, um, uh, Xbox did an amazing effort in the UK of bringing in um, the console gaming with mobile to create points for the users. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe talk a little bit about that. So um, this is a, 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 an execution that's actually a couple of years old, um, and it's around the um, Fable game release. And the idea with, with, if you know about the game Fable, so you're kind of battling and you're either representing... Um, uh, on the good side or the bad side. So you're either a rebel or you're one of the royals that are kind of suppressing the people. Um, and so the idea is that they created this um, mobile game where you can out and about throughout the actual physical location in the UK where they divided up the, the um, area into different territories and you could uh, perform certain tasks and claim that area for either team that you were on, a royal or a rebel. And the more that that happened, you can check in and you know, tweet about it or post it on Facebook and gain more points for that. You got points for when you actually claim the territory. Um, the more people claim those territories, they became solidly either rebel or, rebel or royal. Um, and then they integrated that into um, some of our print advertising. So it talked about it and really um, and amplified it through social and again through media. And we really found that that worked really well because as you were engaging, and this is really kind of combining gamification as well and social, so it was such a great case study of integration of all these different ta channels and tactics, but then as you uh, did the game and actually worked through the game, you gained coins or points that the system would then kind of collect for you, and then once you, game, when, once you bought the game, the game launched, you bought it, and logged in, those points were available to you within the game to buy extra weapons or to upgrade your, your character's costume or home. So it was really an integration of not only the upfront advertising, which was unique and different, an integration of the teams to actually execute that, which is another barrier in terms of when you want to create something really unique, you have 
you know, anywhere from three to five different teams that own different aspects of that that have to integrate internally. But then it also integrated the marketing into the product and enhanced the product experience. And I just, you know, I still tell that team in UK that was just a great example of, you know, the best of coming together both with our agencies, internally looking at the consumer experience across channels, and then bringing that into the product. And it was really a, a unique moment for us, I think. Great. So, um, understanding that there is no monopoly on good ideas, and certainly if there is, I'm not the one that has it. Um, let's open this up to questions. Are there any questions for this team before? I've got some others that I could always ha ask. There's one hand here. If you could go to the mic so they could hear it on the, uh, the video as well. I guess I'll lean over. Um, uh, two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. The first is, can you think of any premium mobile shopping experience, I mean, actually in-store, um, that anyone's doing, a well, uh, doing well around the world? Um, it looks like, just even from the data that was shared earlier, that mobile phones have been used in retail, in-store, mainly for price shopping um, or couponing. Are there any kind of great mobile experiences um, globally? Well, I've started to see um, a lot more connectivity with the mobile platform, actually calling out in store, visit our app, uh, download our app to get our best latest deals, um, sort of an acquisition effort, I would say, more so than anything. Um, but I think folks are getting hip to the fact that it's going to happen anyway, so if I can inform that conversation, actually point them in the right direction, so it's a branded conversation rather than, you know, an Amazon conversation, <laughs> then that works well. Um, I also think, too, uh, with some of our um, work globally over in Germany, we've um, helped to redesign um, the car shopping experience for one of our clients and being able to do a lot of consultation sort of work in the, um, in the actual car dealership environment and then having that all populated on your phone that you can take home with you when you leave um, is a, a pretty key piece of it since it's a high uh, consideration purchase that will take some time, some sharing. And then just um, the usage in Asia and Europe is so ahead of us. Are they doing some more interesting things? Are there a couple key, key things in store? I, th I would say they're not necessarily ahead of us. Um, I, maybe in certain, certain ways, but there, there's cer certainly the way that we're using our devices is quite different from the way things trended, ha have been trending in, in Asia, but. I, th I think, I mean, this was years ago when I was still a global person, but I think one of the things we saw in, in places like Asia where they were adopting QR codes a lot earlier than everyone else, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's almost weird seeing them now because they were actually, I think, using them f six, seven years ago, and that was a massive wave of people using, of using that instead of, you know, anything else. And then in Europe, I think one of the, the big things in Europe was actually the two things, texting and, um, and Bluetooth. Texting because when, um, many years ago, when I was still a teenager and got my first cell phone, it cost you a lot more money to um, call a different mobile carrier. Um, but texting was a flat rate across everything. So texting became very big very quickly. And that allowed a lot of marketing efforts to happen um, and a lot of shows um, to start allowing you to texting stuff in. And then over here, it was with American Idol. And then Bluetooth was, was hugely popular very early on um, with feature phones because you could share songs with people, pictures, um, other things that might be mentioned on stage, but a lot of a lot of opportunity to do things quickly and, and in close proximity, and then interacting with, you know, largely outdoor mediums, and, and also with your own computer as well. I think push those areas ahead quicker in those markets than were happening here. And even I found that strange because when I left the UK, almost no one had a a smartphone, even really a BlackBerry. And a year later, I returned, and everyone had an iPhone. So. And here everyone had a smartphone, you know, a Sidekick, a BlackBerry, a, a Treo, for those who still remember them. And, and that, you know, that was a culture shock for me, but you did see that there were regional differences that, that had occurred. I think there's a, a drugstore in Japan, too, that uh, is purchasing a street level out of home boards, and you take pictures um, using QR codes, you um, take pictures of all the items that you want, and by the time you get home at night, you've got your gallon of milk and your whatever else you needed sitting on your front doorstep. 
Okay. I think um, when I think about global as well, and you mentioned the QR codes, the other the other thing that's really that I really noticed, and I just kind of did a um, about a year or so ago a mobile tour of uh, in Tokyo, and the mobile payment system is just so much far advanced. And I think whether it's in retail, just being able to swipe your phone, you know, with the um, whether it's uh, NFC or, or chips, just the overall concept of mobile payments is just so much. I won't say ahead, but different. Mm. Well, we could say ahead. Um, then as that it just makes that process from marketing through to, to down the funnel to actual purchase, just streamlined. And it's not, oh, is it going to accept this? Do I need to download this? It's just baked into their infrastructure, which is just so much different than ours. Um, and so for that, I think it'll always be some difference um, in terms of how we adopt and how we need to plan it. But it was just a huge difference for me when I was like, wow, this, mm -hmm. like, I don't need a wallet. All I need is a phone as I go through here. I think there's still a, a certain trust level in the States, a country this size. Um, I mean, I'm sure most of you have been to you know, a Starbucks and you know you see the card reader and you can actually just wave your card over. Most people either don't know you can do that, so there's a lack of education, or they just don't trust it. And I think that's been a, a big barrier to, to changing the way people use yeah. to actually have NFC properly in cell phones because mm -hmm. Google Wallet never really took off and they couldn't get the support, but clearly in markets like Japan, it is, you know, they use it for public transport, they use it for simple payments, they use it for big payments, any, anything and everything. And, you know, for that to come here requires a lot of um, trust and education and understanding and you kind of need one group or one company to do that and who that's going to be. Yep. It's not going to be Apple. Um, it's not going to be probably one of the big ones, but someone will come in and really make waves there, I think, and really change things. Right. I think we have uh, time for one, maybe two more questions. Who's got one? There's one. Oh. Tell you what, we'll take both of them. You guys decide who's going first. Wrestle for it. Duke it out. Uh, smartphone penetration approaching 50%. Um, that still leaves a lot of dumb phones. Um, when you talk about mobile, um, do you pretty much focus only on smartphones or are there, you know, there's a, that other half of the audience that has money to spend as well? Um, how are you addressing those people? And, and in a related question, like how does, uh, I'm not sure of global penetration for smartphones, but emerging markets and uh, other parts of the world, Africa, and, um, you know, they, they have different technologies. How do you address mobile with those users? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can start. Uh, primarily, we do um, address smartphones uh, only. I think when, you're, when you start looking at uh, feature phones locally, um, you know, we're, we're more, on, more into, like, uh, dis, you know, display and campaign management. And I think when you get into uh, feature phones, uh, SMS messaging is, is a, a clear winner to, to be able to reach everybody. And then you start getting into... Uh, loyalty programs, so uh, I actually wouldn't think about that much differently than I would um, an email management system, or so so using as a way to to uh, connect with your customers uh, on a you know a, a sort of a, a CMS. Yeah, and I think from a from an Xbox perspective, we definitely, or even Microsoft all up, we definitely see it. The trends that smartphones and tablet users tend to engage more with advertising. So if you think about it from kind of a higher funnel perspective, it makes sense to focus on those devices because they are actually more apt to want to engage and, um, and, and see the advertising and you know, watch the video, do all the things that we want them to do. But that said, there is a place for kind of those lower funnel or more loyalty-based text message programs that then are just ubiquitous across everything, and we have those as well. And so it's kind of balancing and understanding what goals are we trying to accomplish in terms of the marketing funnel and developing the right tactics and strategies for each one of those goals as it relates to mobile. Because, you know, there's mobile media, there's mobile search, there's SMS, there's video, there's mobile social. You know, mobile is a huge category, but within it, there's a lot of different things you can do, and it's just using them all in a way that's smart, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So we have one last question. The gentleman in the back that, that uh, got cut off. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, so we talked about TVs not going anywhere. Well, with the rise of online watching of the TV, Hulu, uh, watch ESPN, the live sporting event, you can catch, catch it anywhere you are without being in front of an actual TV. 
um, those brands that are having a hard time focusing on delivering a message and, and grasping, taking a user or a fan from the TV to a mobile experience to engage them further, how does that play into it? How do you, because it seems like right now it's just an off spit basically. A 30 second spot on TV is the same as a 30 second spot if you're watching a, a TV show on, on Hulu. Mm -hmm. But it seems like a very different audience to some degree and maybe a very different chance to engage that person. How does that factor into it? I think if you can tailor the creative more to the environment, you're obviously going to see better performance in some of those digital environments. Um, I think using things like overlays as well, if I have a 30-second spot, that's all I got to work with, um, I'm going to do an overlay and I'm going to bring in some of the APIs and have some of the deals perhaps or store locator or you know, some of the other video assets that are parked on the YouTube page that might make sense and try and do a little bit more storytelling within that um, overlay unit. Uh, but I think that's what you're calling out is, is part of the gap that we're seeing that I was addressing earlier with digital storytelling. Sometimes you just don't have the asset to do what you want to do. Um, there are companies out there that personalize video assets though, and um, you could either do some personalization based on the environment that the video is running, or based on your own data set, um, you know, specific to behavioral data that you've collected elsewhere. I think there's also still a large number of clients who are very much we actually don't care, we, want to, we just want our ad to be seen as many times as possible with as wide a reach as possible. They don't understand that they are very different environments and, and getting them to understand that is in some cases very difficult and requires a massive change of the guard to actually make it work. Um, and I think that's why we are increasingly seeing a lot of change over a lot of these companies in terms of they're bringing in interactive people, they're bringing in mobile people because they're the ones who know what's actually going on and, and how to understand the space but also integrate it into the traditional efforts which are still the ones that quite frankly the CEO see and I've, I've worked on many accounts where if the CEO or whoever doesn't see their ad during their favorite TV program, that's when you get shouted at. You, they don't care if they don't see it on NewYorkTimes.com or somewhere else. And I, and I think we've touched on what I think is a, a pretty important point in terms of when, uh, when we're developing videos. I mean, for Xbox, we are very video for it, whether it's, you know, game trailers, uh, live action within the games. We, have, we create a lot of videos. And earlier on, you know, it's important to think about, you know, we want to create beautiful videos, obviously, because we have these great games and immersive experiences, and the videos we want to create reflect that. Well, th that doesn't always play well on a small screen. And so really trying to change the mindset of, yes, yeah, still do that big, beautiful thing, but earlier on when you're developing the storyboards and the concepts, plan to get some footage and shots that you can re-edit that to make use on other screens because the big beautiful thing is not gonna work well on this screen and, and everything that you're doing will be lost. Mm. But it was an opportunity where you could have gotten your message across if it was just relevant to that screen. So it's like taking those steps backwards at earlier stages in the creative development with folks that don't necessarily embrace digital, let alone mobile, is mm. kind of our challenge. Got it. Well, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Um, Barbara Williams, Paul Jennings, Kevin Shaver, and Megan Tweed, thanks so much. <laughs>